This is Guitar Business Radio, the podcast for the business of guitar. No reviews, no demos, no idle chatter, just useful dialogue and information to help you get the most out of your guitar-related business. Whether you're a guitar builder or a guitar player, or just something in between, this is for you. Now, here's your host. Oh, wait, it's me, Jeffrey D. Brown. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, this is episode 25 of GBR, our silver episode. Welcome to the show. And it's a special one at that. (laughs) It's kind of hard to believe we're already at 25. But that being said, we continue to bring you original content you won't get anywhere else. Our interviews are unique, informative, inspirational, and often entertaining. And our special guest today is no exception. Steve Wark basically doesn't give interviews, but he founded and runs one of the largest guitar parts operations in the business, which is All Parts. And he's been doing it for 36 years. So he's going to he's going to tell all about All Parts. And I think you'll probably find it as interesting as I did. So stick around and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. I also want to give you some advance info on next week's episode 26, where we will be speaking with Professor Richard Smith. I told him I would introduce him as Professor, which he is, a full professor at the USC Thornton School of Music in studio and jazz guitar. In fact, he was for 16 years the chair of that department, but underlying all that, he's been a working artist and producer with numerous albums and many other projects to his credit over several decades. So be sure to join us for that. should be quite interesting. So we're introducing yet again something brand new on the program called GBR Spotlight. Not terribly original on the title, but that's just what it is. We're going to be spotlighting a variety of guitar-related events and activities that are taking place around the world, around the world as we know it, the guitar world. And we're going to be hearing from the folks who really know the most about it. So today, we're speaking with Meredith Coloma, who is not only a talented guitar builder in her own right at Coloma Guitars, but she's the founder and co-producer of the Vancouver International Guitar Festival that's taking place in a couple of weeks in, of all places, Vancouver. As if it would be in any other place, you know, like, I don't know, Kansas City? I don't think so. But to give us all the details, Meredith Coloma joins us on GBR Spotlight right now. Hey, Meredith, thanks for stopping by and giving us a little information about your festival. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Let's, uh, I always say, let's dive in, but but let's uh, hear a little bit of the history of this event and how it got started and how uh, you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, I used to love going to Montreal Guitar Festival. And when that stopped happening, there was a gap in the Canadian market. So I uh, was teaching a guitar building course to Shaw Salzberg, who is now my partner for the festival. And that's how it happened. Oh, now now that was that was when? When was the first uh, show? Uh, The first show was last year. Okay, so this is your second year, right? Yes. And we started planning it two, three years ago. Okay, so you got it. You you hit the ground running, sort of. Totally. Awesome. Well, let's let's hear a little bit about the facility where this festival is taking place, and then what visitors can expect to see and experience. I'm sure that uh, you can tell us a lot. Well, it's happening at Creekside Community Center uh, in Olympic Village, downtown Vancouver, mm-hmm. which is just along the seawall, and it's a gorgeous place. You can take boats to show up or you can bike there, but it's just a gorgeous place. August 11th and 12th is the date that it's happening. And uh, tell us a little bit about what's going to be going on there. What will people see and experience? Well, you'll have 100 guitar makers and vendors from all around the world. So you'll see handcraft instruments from the top builders, Um, live music. We have a beer and wine Uh, It's called the Time Out Bar upstairs. And there's also hands-on luthier workshops happening all weekend, sponsored by Lee Valley. Wow. Sounds like like fun. Uh, And a lot of, uh, that's a lot of guitar builders. That's a a pretty good size show. Yeah, it's quite big. Really happy with the interest that we've had in it. I have a hunch I may know some of those people here, maybe maybe a handful or two. What what kind of attendance are you expecting at the event? About three to four thousand people over two days, Saturday and Sunday. That's a good crowd. Does it feel crowded at all? 
Last year it was packed. <laughs> we had a line out the door. And uh, when people are showing their instruments, you got to have some elbow room to be able to pick them up and play them. So uh, this year is a little bit bigger and we're hoping that it'll be a little more roomy. Well, it sounds like it uh, sounds like it will be. What uh, what's the cost to get in and, and how can folks get tickets? Tickets can be found at VancouverGuitarFestival.com and advanced tickets are $20 and you can get them at the door, but they're a little more for $25. Okay, so there's uh, for people who are going to come on and buy 10 tickets at a time, they can save 50 bucks. Yeah, something like that. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I wish I was going to be there. It's a little bit of a stretch for me uh, that I'm probably a a thousand miles south of you. But I really wish you uh, well, and I hope that you'll uh, come back and, and tell us how it all went. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me. Great. Good luck to you. Thanks. Now, since this is our so-called silver episode, I thought I would take just a couple of minutes to reflect a bit on how all of this got started. In fact, I started this project in the fall of 2015 as Guitar Business News. I put a lot of time into it. It was primarily a magazine style website, and and that was going to be the basis for everything else. Well, eventually, suffice to say that uh, I decided it wasn't going in the direction I was hoping for at the moment. And so I put it on the shelf for a while until I could uh, come up with a better vision for the project. Now, during all my years as a magazine publisher, you know, our standard MO was to create a hub like uh, a a magazine first. We would do that first. Then over time, we'd add the ancillary pieces like events and supplemental publications and all kinds of stuff like that. That was the conventional approach. But after sitting on the guitar business project for, I don't know, year, year and a half, I came up with the idea of doing things backwards, at least from the way that we had always done it. And and that backwards approach was effectively to create the ancillary activity first, in this case, the GBR podcast, and use any traction from that to start up the main hub, which of course is Guitar Business Magazine and Guitar Business Daily. And the fact that we've made it to 25 episodes with tremendous growth, great interviews, and content you won't get anywhere else, well, that's a pretty good sign that the plan is working according to plan. And I certainly want to thank each and every one of you, our listeners, for your continued interest and support. And we'll look forward to our gold episode, which is coming up in probably another half year or so, not long, uh, early spring of 2019. So with all that, It's now time for something completely different. Well, Steve Wark is the founder and president of All Parts, certainly one of the largest, if not the largest, distributor of guitar, bass, and amplifier parts with over 7,000 different products on hand in their warehouse in Houston, Texas, where they've been operating for the past 36 years. It took us a while to get this exclusive interview to happen, but it did. And we're going to hear the whole story as Steve Wark joins us right here and right now. Well, Steve, thanks so much for coming on the show with us today. It's taken us a while to, to get it together, but uh, really happy to have you on with us. I wouldn't miss it. I've heard a lot about these interviews. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. I hope it's all I hope it's all good. So listen, we like to, you know, we have a little tradition. So we like to start off with a little history and uh, find out what things in maybe the earlier parts of your life that uh, ultimately became those building blocks of your own foundation for career and business. And uh, you can go anywhere that you want with it, but uh, what can you tell us about about that? I've always been interested in music. I played the violin in elementary school and I got to junior high. The violin wasn't very cool, so I switched to saxophone. And at that time, that seemed to be the cool instrument. But by the time I got to high school, I already figured out sax players didn't get to sing, and the guitar was where I really needed to be. I fell in love with the guitar and the bass, and I played bass in bands and toured around Texas after getting out of high school. I went to the uh, University of Houston pursuing a degree in marketing. I got educated and quit, and uh, <laughs> I went on to manage a guitar store. Uh, the problem I always had with bands is that you always know, have to depend on so many other people for it to work. And I knew I was reliable, but I couldn't always depend on everybody else. So I kind of got out of playing uh, I see. live music and mm-hmm. about that time. So you went, to, so so you went, went off to the retail side. What, what did you do there? Well, I worked retail, 
And that was that was quite an education in itself. I worked retail, started out, you know, just as a regular salesperson, went on to become the manager of the store and did that for, uh, I think, about four years. And then I decided to do uh, photography for a while. And I did wedding photography. And all that. I liked that a lot because I only had to depend on myself. Right. And, and uh, the independence of it. Did you have a background in photography of some kind? No, it was just a hobby. Oh, okay. I always had on the side. So then I uh, did that for a couple of years and went to work for another larger music store. And they brought me on as a manager right away. And it was really nice. And I was enjoying it. And we had about three repairmen at the time. This was in the, gosh, the very early 80s, like 80, 79, 80, 81. Okay. Right. It's about the time and I got started. We never started. could get parts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I remember. So we never big... could get guitar parts. Okay. So you're having trouble getting you're, parts. I'm sorry. You remember? I, I, no, I remember that time. Uh, yeah. It was about the time that I kind of uh, dug into the business a little bit. But you were saying that you were having trouble getting parts. Right. Like I said, we had three repairmen and we could never get parts at the time. There were uh, ESP, Schechter, and DiMarzio, and Mighty Might. And ESP and Schechter were both just guitar parts companies at that time, and they would make custom make guitars on special order. Right. But they didn't have a real guitar production. And DiMarzio was mostly pickups, and they were trying to dabble a little bit into guitar parts. And Mighty Might was in the guitar parts back then. So, but with all those companies, we could never get the parts we needed to get all the repairs done. And so the shop I was working at and met the people from Tokai at one of the NAMM shows, and they were going to start bringing in the Tokai guitars because they were very nice. They were nicer than the, uh, a lot of the American guitars that were being manufactured at the time. And so we were bringing those in. I got to look at I said, you know, these have some really nice parts on that retrofit onto the American guitars. Mm, okay. And I, I proposed that, uh, you know, we we start selling guitar parts. And, yeah, they weren't really interested in that. So um, uh, went okay. back and forth for a while. We discussed it for a while. And then I um, decided to, we both all agreed that we would start the company and I would run it. And I actually started in the garage of my house. And the office was in a spare bedroom. Well, that's a common and story, after, uh, isn't it? A lot, you know, a lot of places get yes. get started that way. You, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, and was it called Apparently. all? It was called all parts at that time. Yes. Okay. It's called all parts and with the same logo. Oh, <laughs> well, that's consistency for you, huh? That's right. And apparently, the garage is a great incubator for business because I think even Hewlett Packard started there, and who knows how many other companies. Sure. Sure. So what, uh, well, continue on and let's, let's hear the rest of it. Well, we reached an impasse and I decided I'd, I wanted to uh, leave. And since it was in my house and all the records and every, the whole company was in my garage and spare bedroom, I offered to buy it from them. And uh, since they weren't that interested, they agreed. And, uh, and that was the, that was uh, the real start. And I went there and I, that was the real start. And that's when I really panicked about what have I really done here? <laughs> what have I done? Now, did you move out into uh, another facility of some kind or what? When did that happen? Well, not right away, because mm-hmm. at the time I, uh, I had one child and my wife was pregnant when all this happened. And I thought, oh, I can't support everybody on this. <laughs> I need to get some other jobs. So I went out and got two or three part time jobs at the same time. Wow. But uh, it turned out it all turned out OK. I was able to be home more and or not necessarily home, but in the office <laughs> more. And so I could make cold calls and all that. Well, who were you calling? So the company who, really who, took off. Who were you calling? Well, those, those days we didn't, we didn't have the internet. So sure, That's uh, right. we went to the, the local telephone company and we're in the big city, Houston. And at the phone company, you could get phone books or you could look through phone books of all the major cities all around the country. I remember so that. Yeah. We'd go to the, uh, <laughs> Wow. Music stores, we write down the address and the phone number, and we'd mail them out our little uh, two-page price list. And then a week later, I had followed up with a cold call. Well, what did your catalog uh, What did your catalog look like in those early days? Well, in those early days, we wrote out the price list with a typewriter. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking 1983. Sure. Wrote out the prices on typewriter and then Xeroxed it and stapled it. Yeah. It's like... Three pages, <laughs> and actually two pages front and back. What was so, uh, in terms of the size of the catalog, what what were you uh, selling at that time? Uh, where was the uh, where was the product coming from? And, and you weren't making anything in those days, were you any of your own product, right? No. No, at that time we had about 115 different products 
and they are, we had one supplier and they were in Japan. So all your stuff, most of your stuff was coming from one supplier. Is that what you're saying? Right. And that, was that first year or so. Yes. So you had a hundred and right. 115 products. What, what, uh, what was the response? What kind of uh, headwinds were you running into when you were out pitching that? Uh, you know, we didn't know what everybody else was doing. We just knew that we had a, a good product, had a reasonable price, and we showed it at the NAM show, which was a big boost for us. It got, you know, it's a lot of exposure. We didn't sell anything at that first show, but as I say, it's a show and not a sale. So, uh, it, you know, we were able to meet a lot of people and they were able to see what we were doing and what it looked like. And so in the months after that, it really started to catch hold. And, and what do you think uh, was the impetus for that? What What were the things that uh, were, when you say kind of catching hold, what were people buying? What What was the strong part of the catalog? The strong part of those days were metal parts for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time, there was uh, WD, which was selling just pick guards, and Warmoth, which was selling just wood. And those two people were doing better than the uh, ESP and Checker and all those people. Those guys were really starting to look at just making guitars because it was such a uh, finish good, a one-time big ticket item for them. Right. So I think actually that uh, it was everybody else that helped us catch hold because they couldn't supply and we could, or we tried the best we could at those early days. Sure. So how did the, how did, how did the business grow? In those days, you know, what were the things that really made a difference, you know, in the growth of the business? There was a product we came out. That was, we think, Floyd Rose came out. I met Floyd Rose, I think, in 83 or 84. And he was standing in front of this Tiger guitar booth trying to sell this tremolo he had. And then by the next show, he was with Kramer and, you know, and the rest of that's history. But we came out with a tremolo that... Didn't, that lock had fine tuners and it didn't uh, require any extra holes. I mean, you could put it on a vintage guitar and there was a locking nut that was held in by screws that went straight into the nut slot and you didn't have to shave anything off the nut, off the neck. And they used the same, used two of the six holes that mounted the vintage tremolo. And so it, it, it wasn't as efficient as the Floyd, but it uh, worked really well and we it really was a lot less money. So it, it just took off and that really made a difference as far as having a product that sold a lot that was unique to us and uh, helped with the cash flow. Sure. And and, and you say that, that was unique uh, to you. I, I'm assuming for what you're telling me that uh, a lot of how much of what you were selling was sort of exclusive products were these made specifically to your specs or were they also available through other people at all or was it was it just all parts starting out all the parts we had were available through somebody else you know we were selling tremolo arms and pig guard screws and cinematic bridges and vintage style trims all those things that you know you can, at the time you can get from almost any other supplier also so it was nothing unique but when that tremolo, we called it the B-52, because it was a dive bomb, but actually the B-52 wasn't a dive bomb, but not everybody knew that, and we used that, and uh, like I say, it, it really helped put us on the, on the map. And then, and then, so from that point, and about what year would you say that that was all transpiring? Uh, you remember, or at least roughly about? I would, I would say about 85. Okay, so now you're a few years into it, and you're already getting some traction. Sounds right. like. And at, by this point, you had moved. Uh, are we still in the garage? Well, we moved to a house with a two car garage. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so we stepped doubled up. our facility. <laughs> That's right. You, you doubled your space, huh? <laughs> we did. How long before you, uh, uh, we, before you graduated out of that? Well, I hate to say this, but then we moved to a two and a half car garage with a garage apartment on top. Nice. And uh, that was the next step. And then finally, it wasn't until like 1991 that we got a, a legitimate facility. Okay. So that's, you know, so roughly the better part of a decade before that actually happened. So that's a pretty, right. you know, you kept your overhead low and, you know, didn't, didn't jump too far ahead of your skis there. Well, the problem also was that in the 80s, there was a uh, kind of a, a financial 
failure or whatever with the banking industry, which means there was no money available to borrow. That's right. That's right. I remember that. I was, of course, so very young. What had to do was, <laughs> well, of course, yeah. myself. Yeah, right. I'm barely out of elementary. <laughs> right. But uh, so we had to start making our inventory turns more frequent so that we could have, you know, the cash to just a good steady cash flow. And so at those days, we were probably getting eight inventory turns a year. Okay. Order smaller and just keep churning it just to get that cash flow in so that it enabled us to do other things because we couldn't rely on the bank at all. Yeah, you had, to, you had to be your own bank, basically. Right, and actually, it was a good lesson for us because uh, we went to the bank saying, look, you know, we had this line of credit and we need to borrow some more. And they said, sorry, all, all loans and lines of credits are frozen, which was a, quite the eye-opening experience. So as a result, we learned never to borrow money from the bank again. And then ever since those years, that middle 80s, we've never borrowed any money from any bank or any institution Uh since we couldn't rely on them, we decided to just keep saving and plodding away and make our own line of credit well, in the house, you know. There's a good lesson there. That's a good lesson. I mean, uh, yeah. you, you know, they don't, you don't see that too often, uh, and especially anymore. So it, it's a, a, you know, a wonderful lesson. So in the 90s, let's talk about what happened in the 90s. Well, you know. we were able to come out with, uh, we were getting more attention, and so we were able to come we had people approaching us with ideas for parts or parts they had patented and uh, they just needed uh, manufacturing and distribution. And so that all came to us and helped, you know, bring us along farther. At the same time, we're at a stage where we could approach all the major manufacturers in this country and say, look, you know, we, we need these switches or these pods or we need this machine for us and all that. And so that all became good. And the more shows we went to, the more people we met and, we met people like to date. I think we do business with, we source parts from 14 different countries, including the USA. We have tremolo arms made here in China, Texas, where uh, China is most known for uh, China beer, but uh, they also can make tremolo arms up there. And we have a lot of manufacturing across the USA. But finding people, finding companies that can make product correctly, consistently, to the right specs that we need at the price we need. It's always been a challenge. So tell me a little bit about your typical customer profile. You know, we have, we're pretty diversified in that. We sell to every major manufacturer in this country, actually almost every boutique, every um, most builders, and like I say, every major manufacturer in this country, most of the ones in Europe and most of the ones in Japan, uh, we all sell to these people. And so... That's one part of our business. That's not as profitable, but it's, you know, instead of ordering half a dozen of this or one or two of this, they are, you know, let me have 500 of this or 1,000 of this or 2,000 sure. of that. Yeah. And so uh, that's one part of it. But like I say, when uh, in 2008, when the economy changed, all that went away. So it's important that we still had all our uh, dealers. The dealers, I mean, we do sell retail to the end user. Usually it's because... They don't have a dealer in town with them or close to them. We sell to a lot of small towns or the dealer doesn't want to stock or special order in the part they need or want. Yeah, you don't encourage uh, that the, retail business, though, really. I mean, I've I've seen that that's not something that there's different signs along no, the way that not. say, you know, uh, you, you might be better off. Uh, in fact, I think I read where some place you say, well, you might get a better price at a local store. Uh, is that true? Right. That is true. And we support the dealers because of a number of reasons. One, the dealers order, some dealers order every week, some order every month, some order every three months, but they order consistently all year long. The end user orders one time and maybe you'll order again, maybe you never will. You know, and it's the dealers that got us to where we are today. So it's along those same lines of you have to dance with the person who took you there. Sure. Of so, course. uh, of course, you know, we have a lot of respect for the dealers. They have a hard row to, to make money. You know, they say it's really bad now, brick and mortar, blah, blah, blah but it's been hard for them all along. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah just, it's, it's a different type of competition now. Since actually I came from retail music and most of our salesmen all came from retail music. Everybody understands that whole point of view and, and they have the ability to, you know, they can show your product to a lot of people where that may not visit your website or may not be as familiar with you. They'll put it in their face and say, well, look, they'll take care of your problem. 
So it's, you know, the dealers are like more salesmen out there for us. Yeah, it's all changed. You know, it kind of reminds me a little bit uh, of the magazine world, which I, I spent many, many years in. And uh, not to sneak in a plug, but of course, most people know that we're in the midst of starting our own magazine called Guitar Business and uh, some offshoots from that. And uh, I'm of the opinion that there's, I mean, it's a very similar uh, comparison that uh, people still like to go into the store and pick something up and look at it before they buy it. And the same way that people still like to actually pick up a magazine and and read it. That doesn't mean the world hasn't changed a lot. You know, it has completely, right. completely. But um, it's an interesting comparison. And uh, I don't think, you know, I don't think we're done with the with the brick and mortar store. Is it going to change? Sure. Everything changes. That's, r- that's right. We actually, you know, just through um, people getting different changes in their lives, the brick and mortars, we get new dealers every week. And we also lose new dealers every week either they sell or, you know, they decide they, business forces them out or whatever. But uh, the quantity of dealers has always increased every year for us. You know, so I don't know how much the uh, brick and mortar, as much as they want to talk about that. There's so many p- people that, you know, the industry is such an industry of passion. Sure. Of and course so many is. people that love the guitar that they want to uh, be with it. So. Well, I'm the same way. Um, I spent a lot of years in medical media, uh, as I call it, my hiatus years. And uh, <laughs> those are very lucrative, lucrative years. But this is where the passion is. I'm a guitar guy sir, for since I was a kid and uh, I'm making less money, but I'm sure enjoying it a lot more. And I know I'm going to live longer. And especially at the, at the age That's of, right. that the young middle age that you and I are getting to be, um, <laughs> that, you know, that's important and you got to do what you love. But you've been doing this now uh, something like 36 years or am I correct? It's it's a number like that, isn't it? Yes. And you're still yes, there. Correct with all parts. You know, and yes. uh, one of the things I want to jump around a little bit, but I'd love to to get a big picture of the company, of the of the size of the company, the scope, the breadth of the catalog, some some big numbers. If there are big numbers, I suspect there are, but I'd like to get a sense of of the bigness of the company, especially compared <laughs> compared to where you started. Uh, I mean, what can you what can you tell us to give us that that big picture view of all parts? Well, starting out, of course, it was my wife and I, and I was <clears throat> excuse me, I was working in retail at the same time. We were getting that going, so I was only available one day during the week, and she was working it most of the time. Compared to now, where we have twenty five plus employees, and it's in a uh, 15,000 square foot building that we're getting kind of cramped in. Uh, there's been a lot of changes along those ways. The company is, we have a, I believe we have, depends on how far you want to divide it down, but I believe there's a, about 11, and I'm sorry, not 11, 7,000 uh, different SKUs, different line items that we keep track of, inventory, and sell. Wow. We sell to um, every country that there's money. So it, it's taken a while, but... Uh, that's coming along. So we have counting our distributors that we have around the world. I believe there's, can't really remember exactly, but it's, I think 9,000 customers, somewhere between seven and 9,000 uh, dealers, mm-hmm. either they're OEMs or their distributors or their builders or guitar shops or repairmen, but we well. have them all over. We also have a, uh, before gas prices went crazy, we used to have, about 10 or 11 reps across the country that would go out and put the catalog in front of the retailer's nose and say, well, there's this, you know, that you could just put this up there on the side of the counter and it would sell for you. When gas prices went up, all of those reps decided they could be a telemarketer. Uh-huh. And so that we can do that ourselves. So now we're down to uh, three different areas, one being the Northwest, one being the Mid-Atlantic, and one being Canada, where we actually have rep firms or reps that will actually go out and put a catalog in front of them and say, wait, wait look what you're missing. <laughs> Is there, uh, are there any, uh, seasonal aspects of the business? I would think probably not, but is there any time of the year when business, uh, 
climbs or declines, or is it pretty steady the whole time? Surprisingly, uh, there is three seasons for us. Summer is always slow, I think, for retailers also. And it's from end of May through the middle of September, even the end of September, it's a slow time for us. From September through December, it's building. That's, that's a good time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And at the end of December, you have Christmas. Well, guitar parts are not a very popular Christmas gift. <laughs> but, for a select few, they may be, but probably not for the masses. <laughs> But guitars and money are. And so right. people get, you know, get guitars and they say, well, this guitar is great, but, you know, I'd really like to change this and this. Or they get it and they say, wow, this broke right away. This, I need to fix this. Or they have money and they say, you know, I've been waiting for a little cash so I can upgrade this on my guitar. So January, and you throw in the uh, NAM show from January through April, that is our busy, busy season. Now, you are, do you... St- Still go to the NAM show? Or are you still there? And- We're still there. We're, uh, we've been exhibiting at the California NAM show continuously since I think January of 83 was our first show. Mm-hmm. And we haven't missed one in all that time. We used to do the Chicago show a lot. I remember, we, I remember when it was in course, Chicago. I, yeah, I, used to, I went out there a few yeah. times. I'm only about 20 minutes from Anaheim down here in Newport Beach. So uh, no. it's, it, there's, I have no excuse for <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, for, for not being there. Uh, but uh, but is that uh, is that a beneficial? Uh, obviously, you've been coming every year. You must be getting something uh, good out of it. Does it pay for itself? It does, just through the exposure. I mean, I think this last show was 110 or 105,000 people. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Uh, that's, that's a lot of people to have the opportunity to show your, you know, what you do. Yeah, too. yeah, And it's also for us, it's a great time to connect with all our uh, OEM accounts that are also exhibiting. Yep. And all our dealers, you know, we they get a chance to come by and they all come by and say, so show me what's new. Cause we had new parts every week almost. Do you sell anything at the show? You take orders for anything? No. Okay. It's just you to take show. orders, but we're mainly there just to show and most of our sales from the show are in the weeks following they say yeah well i guess you know i know i need some stuff yeah but let me get back to the shop and see what i got and see what's going on and i'll i'll shoot you out in order yeah i I really wasn't referring to retail sales but and there are certainly some trade shows i used to work many many trade shows for years um and some of those shows you know they have little rooms and people go in and they write their orders and i think they even do that at, at the nam show and some of the companies but but you're not really uh, doing that much of that sort of thing. We do that, and we frequently get people that say, okay, I've been waiting for you. And they come, and then they just, we have a, usually there's like a 20-foot long booth that wraps around on the ends that's just solid parts from wall to wall, floor to ceiling. Mm-hmm. And they walk along and say, all right, give me one of these oh. and two of these and <laughs> I mean, you know, a dozen of those. And we follow them around with a clipboard, writing all this stuff down. And then there's also some dudes that just come in, hand it to us, and just say thanks. We appreciate. That's a lot easier. Every (laughs) shot give us. It's a lot. Yeah, (laughs) that's a lot easier. I I can imagine that. That's a, a, you know, certainly a kind of a cumbersome way to take an order. That's, but uh, you know, you got to take them whichever way they come. I would imagine. Right. We're never one to refuse an order. No, I don't. I don't think so. (laughs) Uh, What. Do you have competition? I mean, I mean, I think you probably do, but uh, where do you think you're positioned in the business? We do have competition. Um, and we also have the same competition the industry has with video games and other distractions. Sure. Of course, we want everybody to be playing guitar. But uh, as far as our position in the industry, by talking to some shared vendors, we have a pretty good idea that uh, we're... I don't want, there's no way to say it on black and black and white that, yes, I can prove this is so, but I believe we're the, the top company in our uh, our little niche here. Well, I've heard that from some I people. From I mean, talking- yeah, I've, I've, I've heard similar things. You know, nothing wrong with saying that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's Sometimes good. when you say you're number one, it's like painting a target on your back. Yeah. So uh, yeah. We, well, we, we know that we're, if we're not number one, we're right, right, really close to it. But, bottom uh, line is like you're I in a, from talking to yeah. shared vendors. Yeah, you're in a good position. Uh, you're in a good position. We're, well, we're, we're happy. Let me ask you a little more subjective kind of question. Uh, do you have any concerns about uh, where we are 
in the business as a whole today, you know, and, and do you think we need anything needs to, to change, uh, to stay on the right path? Do you have any concerns? Well, sure. You can't be in business without having some concerns. Over the time we've been in it, you know, we've seen a lot of changes when MIDI was going to take over the guitar industry. Then there was all the chains that were going to buy everybody out. And then the internet came along. So I don't know if there's a really a right path or even how to control the path. I think mainly we just have to react to it, react to what, you know, as much as big guys and the little guys try to control the market, the general population and the end user actually has all the control. Uh, let me ask you, you know, what kind of growth do you see down the road uh, uh, and do you see growth and how do you think you're going to accomplish it if you do? Well, we're obviously are hoping to continue growing and making an impact in the industry. Uh, we're always looking for new exclusive designs and parts along with working out licensing arrangements with uh, new and existing companies. We think that we're, we're actually starting a big push this year with better inventory management and uh, more targeted advertising still believe that there's a lot of people that don't realize what they can do with their guitars. It's kind of like, a, you know, people buy a stereo system back in the day and that was it. And then it got to where people found out you could buy components and make it exactly what you want. And it seems like the younger guitar players nowadays really want to take the guitar and make it theirs. Not like somebody that they're trying to emulate that the popular player, but they want it to be something personal more so than my generation or some subsequent generations, which we were always looking more for performance or to look like somebody we really admired. Uh, it seems like the younger crowd now wants to have something very unique to them. So that's a good thing for us. Sounds like it. That there's a big market out there, big market for, you know, letting these people reflect their personality and in their instruments. That's a really great way to look at it, and you've really identified something, and uh, probably something that you're going to you're going to exploit. So, finally, let me uh, just ask you a, a, a kind of a, a simple question. Now, uh, what three and a half decades later, uh, does all parts look like you thought it would when you started out? Nothing at all. Uh, starting out, we never thought it would get this big or have this much of a worldwide presence. It was more of a means of survival at the time. And we didn't really have any aspirations as to where we're going to take this, how big to get a get. It was just, let's get this going. And let's, uh, you know, I wanted to make enough support my family. And the second goal behind that was I wanted to make enough money. So I didn't have to work on my own car anymore. Uh, <laughs> take it to a shop. Yeah. Well, those are little luxuries. You know, we all know how that, That's how, right. how that goes, but you've been at it a long time. Uh, you plan to be at it for a while longer, I would imagine, eh? You know what? I'm still excited when I come to work. Um, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but I enjoy all parts that I really enjoy the customers. I enjoy the uh, sourcing the parts and uh, talking to the des different designers of people that come up with new ideas. Uh, we've come up with several ourselves, and I've had a few tools that I've designed myself and parts, but it's always, I guess it all boils down to the people. It's the People I, we, we work with in the shop and the people that we deal with over the phone and at the shows. And it's the guitar. It's just, a, like I say, I still have the passion. So basically, you you get up and, and you love what you do, right? Is that right, Steve? Right. Yeah. That's right. So you and me, we're going to live longer. <laughs> so we both <laughs> we both get up and we both love what we do. Listen, this has really, really been interesting. And I think that um, our audience in particular is going to find this to be uh, just as interesting as I did. And I really want to thank you for taking the time. I'm glad we finally uh, were able to, uh, uh, to get this on the show. And, and I hope we can uh, chat again sometime. I really appreciate it. Me too. It's been my pleasure, and I look forward to coming back again next year. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll have some up. we'll have something to talk <laughs> about. We'll compare notes. We'll compare notes. So That's thanks. Right. Thanks again, Steve. It's great talking to you. You too, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Welcome back to the back of the show, where if you made it this far, you're probably willing to take a chance on unpredictable topics and discussion you might not necessarily expect on a guitar-related show. Well, that was indeed an interesting interview with Steve Wark. 
And it was definitely not an easy one to nail down. Steve is a busy guy, and there's been a lot of stuff going on at all parts in the way of expansion and infrastructure upgrades and that sort of thing. But that's really just part of the business and the job of the producer. And someday, I may actually have a producer on this show. That would certainly seem like a bit of a luxury, but uh, for now, I will have to do that job as well. But I thought Steve had a great story of a garage business that over time, a long time, with dedication to and passion for the work, built a solid organization on a strong foundation. And as a result, has been able to weather a lot of storms over the last 36 years. So a lot of good lessons to be learned there. I also thought uh, that this would be of interest to a lot of our listeners in the business. And frankly, many of the folks that I talked to about this as an upcoming interview responded pretty much the same way. Like, oh yeah, cool. I just got my order from All Parts yesterday or j this morning <laughs> you know, or whatever. So I felt pretty comfortable that we were on the right path with this one. And by the way, if you have thoughts of your own on this interview, you can leave a comment on the official episode page at guitarbusinessradio.com or on our Facebook page at Guitar Business or on Twitter at Guitar Business. We'd love to hear from you. Also, I didn't have a chance earlier to mention in the GBR Spotlight segment that we're certainly interested in spotlighting other guitar-related industry events and activities that might be of value to our listeners. So if you're involved in one of those things, reach out to us, let us know, and we'll be happy to give it some consideration for the show. And by the way, you can reach us a lot of different ways. Like I mentioned, visit our contact page on our website, at guitarbusinessradio.com. Call us on our hotline at 888-777-2404. Connect on social media at Guitar Business. We're always happy to hear from you. You know, I always try to end all of my interviews on a positive or inspirational note. As I do at the end of the show itself, one of the things I heard from Steve Wark in the final moments of our discussion is that after 36 years, he still gets up every morning looking forward to his work with seemingly the same kind of passion that drove him in the earlier years of all parts. It's pretty hard to deny the power of passion and loving what you do. It's the right path to follow, but it's not for the impatient among us. But if we learn to acknowledge all the positive things that happen to us each day from the very smallest plus moments to the more obvious wins, we can move with that incremental flow that constantly delivers us a net gain. And it's that net gain over time that really matters. Again, as always, stay positive, keep your focus on the destination, and make sure that all your options are open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on episode 26. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.